There's a rumor that we're going to have a baptism this morning. There is no greater way to start a service off than with a baptism. And if you, uh, if you hadn't heard that uh, today, uh, Mr. Roman is getting baptized by Grandpa. Man, that is such a huge blessing. I'm so excited for them. That's a, that's a mile marker and just a wonderful, wonderful moment today. So uh, after announcement, they'll be coming and, and sharing, uh, sharing in that. So be, be prayerful about that. Um, if you have your bulletins, we have, we have a few announcements. The, the, our, our student ministries team has met. We've got a full calendar coming up. And on the back of your calendar has the youth and children, just kind of a snapshot. That's not everything we're doing. That's just kind of the highlights. Um, and the first and foremost that I need prayer about is we're having a lock-in this Wednesday night. Uh, so uh, the, the youth will come and bring their friends to church Wednesday night and uh, just stay. And we'll have a fun, fun, sleepless night. So please be in prayer for uh, the youth and the chaperones and all those in, involved uh, that we'll have a good, safe night. And because I don't own a calendar, uh, we have a, an event the next day. After locking, what was I thinking? Uh, but the next day, we are actually going to um, um, Pulaski Elementary, uh, and we're going to set up a table in the front because it's their open house, and we just want to love on them. We'll have a, a church sign out there, and we'll be giving away food and water and giving opportunities to pray for people or people to leave prayer requests uh, just as a show of love to that. So uh, the youth and, and I will be doing that the 4th, which is Thursday, Pulaski Elementary. Um, and then the following Wednesday will be volleyball because that will be the first day of school. Oh, yeah, it's just coming ready or not. So, um, and then there's there are several things we'll we'll talk about later. The youth are going to visit the nursing home the 21st, um, and we have several other things like that. Uh, by way of a little more immediate announcement, uh, this evening the. Um, um, these, our seniors were supposed to go to the Stringer Barn for a, uh, an event to, to see the bees and the honey and all that. Uh, that has not been canceled. That has been moved because of the pending rain or the imminent rain. Um, it's, it's on the way. And uh, so they're going to meet here at the, uh, at the Fellowship Hall at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock. So meet here at the gym and spread the word for those that are not here, maybe want to come tonight. If you'll let people know that, that y'all are meet, meeting at 5 and, and having the festivities here. And uh, I had a few youth just cringe because I said we may have an open gym tonight. Don't worry. We'll go eat. We'll do something. They're going to start at 5. We'll, we'll shuffle in after that and still have some time to hang out this evening. So uh, a lot going on in the church. If you're not connected, I want to just encourage you uh, to hang out, uh, to, to lean in. There's small groups activities. There's all kinds of ways to plug in. Uh, there is so, this is a wonderful service, and we are so glad you're here to this service. This is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot going on behind the scenes, a lot of ministry opportunities. Um, we have a, a, a mission trip going to the Dominican Republic coming up. Uh, we have local missionary uh, mission opportunities. I just mentioned one or two of them. Um, and just a lot of uh, neat connection in this church. So if you're not fully plugged, I want to encourage you to look around, talk to someone, and, and get connected. We would love to have you in our church. We are so glad you're here. Let's go ahead and open with a word of word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the chance to be in your house today. Father, I thank you so much uh, for this baptism. Uh, that it's, it's an outward picture of an inward decision. And Father, I thank you for the faith that's been passed down through this generation through this family that, that serve you, that love you. And, Father, that that love has been passed on and has been caught by the next generation. Father, I pray just uh, that you would begin to do a great work in Roman's life. And, Father, that you would help parents and grandparents steer and direct him on this next steps. And, Father, I thank you so much for the privilege to be in your house today. Bless this time, Father. We love you so much. In your name, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It feels very unusual to be back in this baptistry, and I want to begin by thanking Pastor Corey and Brother Danny for allowing me the privilege to, to uh, get to baptize my first grandchild. Uh, this is the same baptistry where my three children were baptized, 
and it, we're starting a good precedent again this morning. Um, as Becky and I get to come back and see folks that we haven't seen in a long, long time, it just reminds us of how sweet heaven will be one day when we all get to come together and share stories. And I'm thinking about stories that the folks in Rockwood will tell you all one day about me, that it will embarrass me in heaven. <laughs> And the stories that you will tell one day, the folks in Rockwood, that will again embarrass me. <laughs> but that's the love of Christ that bonds us together. And I just want to thank you all for the privilege of being here this morning for this baptism. So, on Roman. Roman said he was a little bit nervous. I was like, just about every single person that gets baptized is nervous. One over here. I was like, but on the other side, I've never had a single person say that was harder than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and most young people say, can we do it again? <laughs> so uh, I told him also, I was eight when I was baptized up in the north part of the county, and Brother Don's the one who baptized me. But I, didn't, I don't remember a whole lot about it. And every young person, because of that, I tell them to look at the crowd and take a mental snapshot to try to remember this day because this is a big day in our walk with the Lord. So you got that picture in your mind? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's cup her hands. Cup your hands the way I told you, okay? So, Roman, have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? All right. So in obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In with me this morning as we worship uh, in song. That's what a great encouragement to see this morning. Um, we're going to sing a song about how God is mighty to save, and he saves from the smallest, littlest kid, um, the weakest to the strongest, who we think are strong. So uh, this morning, let's worship him. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave, so take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. my life to follow everything I believe in now I surrender put your voice this morning Savior he can move the mountains Savior he can move the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save Author of salvation, heroes and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. One more time. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquered. Conquer the grave, 
shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen seated as the choir sings for us this morning.
Thank you, choir. That was great. Um, as you guys know, uh, and seeing the news this last week, uh, the flooding in eastern Kentucky was really bad uh, starting on Thursday. And there's a lot of devastation. The death toll is over 15, uh, was the last I saw. Uh, and so people have been asking, what can we do um, to love on those people who have uh, been affected by this week's rain and the flash floods? Um, and the good thing is that as part of the cooperative program, we have been giving to, uh, you know, as Baptists, to the Kentucky Disaster, uh, the Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Organization, which is the largest disaster relief, relief organization in the state, and they are super organized uh, and well-led. Um, so we have been giving to that uh, for years. And um, so that's how uh, the Kentucky Baptists have um, kind of started to meet those needs already this week. They've deployed on Saturday. Um, but for us, what can we do if we would like to give more? There is a link to uh, give to the flood relief on our website. It's phbcsomerset.org slash giving. Uh, and right there, if you follow the link, uh, you will be able to find um, a place to give with a little drop-down menu that says, you know, general funds, flood relief, whatever. Um, so if you select flood relief, that will all go to additional support for the Kentucky Baptist disaster relief, specifically um, in the flooding in eastern Kentucky. Um, now, aside from that, we are looking for uh, someone to partner with. If you have material things you would like to give, we're looking for what do people need? What are they asking for on the ground? So stay tuned to the Facebook page. We might send out a text message or a call when we figure out what exactly is needed and what we can send. We have a trailer we could load up and take over there, um, as long as there's someone to receive it. Um, and other than that, this is the second time in the last year that Kentucky Baptists have been deployed within an hour and a half of us. Um, and there's an opportunity for people who want to be hands-on and be one of those people who go and meet the physical needs of the people there by, by working and being face-to-face -face with them um, we can't all go because it would be too, way too crowded. We take up resources. But if there's, there's a training uh, on October 8th in London, if you would like to be trained for Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief. And so whenever, whenever disasters like this happen, uh, and Ron Crow, who's the leader of Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief, he sends out uh, orga organization-wide emails and communications so that whenever this stuff happens, people who are in the Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Program who've gone through the training, who know, who know how it works, um, can, can reply to the email and say, hey, I'm willing to go, I'm ready, and they'll send you out there. Um, and we could have a team from Pleasant Hill if we had people interested in learning how to um, participate in that disaster relief. Uh, we'll, we'll be going on October 8th. Uh, it's a Saturday in London. Uh, the cost is $30, um, and if, if that's an issue, we can... We can work around that, but there is opportunity for us to serve um, first and foremost with prayer, second with finances right now. I know that it's we all want to jump in with our hands and feet and, and work face to face with our neighbors, um, but there is already people doing that, and that need is filled. Now they just need backup, um, and so we would like to be uh, able to be those first people on the ground in the future, um, so keep in mind the October 8th date. Uh, and, and keep in, in prayer uh, those in Eastern Kentucky. And Brother Corey is going to come lead us uh, in prayer specifically for those affected by this week's flood. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, you can, yeah, you could write it. Yeah, that's a good question, Kathy. You could write a check and just put in the memo, um, Kentucky Baptist Disaster Relief Flood uh, or Eastern Kentucky Flood, just something to mark it so that we know what it's for. Uh, and the same thing, if you, if you don't have a checkbook and you don't want to do it online, you can do cash if you want and just, like, tape a note to it or put it in an envelope and write on there, flood relief, and we'll get it where it needs to go. Thanks, Kathy. Let's pray for our state and those in eastern Kentucky affected by the flood. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, it's amazing how things can change sometimes. We go to bed at night, and then we wake up, and the whole world has changed. And, Lord, I pray for our families in eastern Kentucky, Lord, that you'd be with them. Lord, I pray that you'd send them the help they need. Lord, use us as well uh, to help meet that need. And, Father, I pray, Lord, that even now that there'll be boots on the ground that are helping them uh, 
uh, get through this horrible time and tragedy. Father, we're reminded, Lord, that we need you every moment of every day. And Lord, as we gather here today, Lord, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son. And Lord, may we have a heart of gratitude because of all that, that you've already done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with me as we continue to worship in song. See? 
Thank you so much for who you are, who you've made us in Christ, that your mercy is more than our sin could ever pile up against, uh, that there is a fountain flowing with righteousness that we have been, our sin has been taken away from us and, and we've been given righteousness in its place. Father, we thank you so much for that promise in the gospel. Um, Father, I pray this morning as uh, your word is preached that it would not fall on deaf ears, that you would prepare our hearts to hear it, um, that we might look more and more like Jesus and know you more and more every day. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. I'm so glad y'all came down. I would, can you sit next to me? I need somebody to sit next to me. I'm lonely up here. Thank you. So I was thinking about this week, I was thinking about different things we do. But no, no, you've got a few friends, don't you? You've got a few friends. Well, our first church, when, when Brother Danny was a young man and Miss Stephanie, we just got married, and we had Will, and Will was an itty-bitty. He was like smaller than Rex. He was a little bitty boy, and he had a little girl in our church. Her name was Elizabeth, and they were best friends. I should have pulled up a picture. We had They were like the flower girl and the, and the ring bearer for like, I see him. For like five weddings, they were always together. Every time you saw one with the other, they'd hold hands. They were really sweet. You want the microphone? No, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> we're all right. So, um, so they were they were always together. And then one day they were in nursery, and they were playing. And Elizabeth dropped her toy. No, thank you. Elizabeth dropped her toy, and it broke. And her face turned inside out, and she just began to cry, and she, nobody could stop it. And she just cried and cried and cried. And the nursery lady, Miss Sharon, she said, I just picked her up. She said, I started rocking her. She said, it's okay, let's, we'll try to fix it. It'll be okay. She was trying to make her feel better. And she said, I looked down, and Will's face began to turn inside out. And she said, he went over to the diaper bag and opened it up and dug around and pulled out his buddy. I don't know if you had a buddy or a stuffed animal, or a, or a blanket, but that was his. Like, we were scared he'd lose it because he couldn't sleep without it. And he looked at Buddy, and he walked up to her with tears in his eyes, and he said, Elizabeth. And he gave her his most precious gift to help her feel better. And what, what, what touched me about that is that that was an outward expression of an inward feeling. I'm going to hold your hand. An outward expression with an inward feeling. And Brother Corey, listen, will you hold this for me? Here, hold that. Hold, hold both hands. Hold hands. Both hands. Both hands. Show, show them. Here, two hands. There it is. Oh. There it is. Okay. So it has fasting. Brother Corey's going to talk about fasting. And fasting is something we can do that's an outside expression of what we feel inside. Because sometimes we need to tell God that we're sorry. That's right. I said, can you, hold on, say sorry. Uh, it's, uh, sorry. Just say sorry. Sorry. Sorry, all right. 
All right. So sometimes we just need to say sorry to God, and we can say that by fasting. Sometimes we need to say, God, I need direction. And we can, we can go to him, and we can, we can put away food or electronics, and we can say, God, you have my undivided attention. Undivided attention. But it's an outward expression of our inside feeling. Right. There it is. Shh. We're almost done. All right. All right. So here we go. We're going to pray and ask God to help us with, the, with, with showing him on the outside, what we feel like on the inside. All right, we're going to pray. Shh, we're going to pray. Let's talk to God. Come, close your eyes. Close, close, sorry. Go up. There you go. Dear Jesus, help me love you with my actions on the outside and let them express the, the feelings I have on the inside. I love you, Jesus, in your name. Everybody said I feel a little better now, Devin. I used to think that Phoenix was going to replace me, but I think he's going to replace Danny before he replaces me. <laughs> oh, me. And Brother Marty, glad to have you and your family here today. And I am sure if they knew I was preaching on fasting, they would have asked you to preach this morning. So we're glad you're here, brother. Uh, we are doing a spiritual discipline series called Airplane Mode, where we practice spiritual disciplines. If you think about it, in the world today, we're so hectic, we're so busy, that we need to turn off the noise, and we need to connect with God more than, more than anything. Sometimes that's hard to do. We're going through a series where we're looking at different spiritual disciplines we can put into practice in our lives in order to pursue God better and be more devoted to him. Uh, today we're going to talk about fasting. That it's not, this is not a message that you'll want to hear. This is not even a message I will want to preach. Come on now, all right? But we're going to talk about it. Why? Because it's in the Bible. I don't know uh, if you know this or not. I didn't know this until I was preparing. But did you know that in most Christian circles, you rarely hear the word fasting mentioned? And only a few times will there be a few people that have actually read anything about it. And did you know that in Scripture that uh, fasting is mentioned more times than baptism? That's right. Fasting is 77 times, baptism 75. And we just had a baptism today, so that's interesting. Now, what is fasting? Uh, I like Donald Whitney's definition. He said a biblical definition of fasting is when a Christian voluntarily abstains from eating food for spiritual purposes. Now, you've got to make sure you get the spiritual purposes right. Uh, sometimes people fast for health reasons, for diet reasons, for medical reasons. And I don't know who said this, but it's uh, one of those unknowns I found. It said, fasting without prayer is starvation. Okay? So let's just kind of get that out of the way. Um, when we are fasting, yes, we're not eating, but we're also trying to fill our minds and our hearts full of God. We're pursuing Him. We're taking that time that we would spend eating, and we're really seeking God and pursuing Him. And that's the whole point of fasting. You know, as I was looking at a list of people that are mentioned in the Bible that have fasted, it kind of surprised me. For instance, Moses was on that mountain, you know, when he fasted. Uh, Hannah was fasting as she prayed for God to give her a child. King David, of course, he fasted. Elijah he fasted after his victory over Jezebel. Uh, Ezra, uh, he was the scribe. He was fasting uh, when he was mourning over uh, the faithlessness of, of Israel. Uh, Nehemiah, he fasted before God sent him uh, back to Jerusalem to repair the walls that had been torn down and destroyed. Uh, Esther, she fasted with God's people for three days before she approached the king to intervene so that their people would not be exterminated. Uh, Daniel, he fasted, the prophet. Uh, what about the people of Nineveh? You know, Jonah came 
and he preached, and the whole city repented, and they fasted. Even the cattle fasted because nobody fed them. Some of you are going, that's the only way I'm going to fast is if somebody doesn't feed me, right? And then you've got uh, Jesus. He fasted when his public ministry began. Uh, Paul, the apostle, Saul, who became Paul, uh, he fasted uh, when he was first converted to Christ. Uh, the Christians at Antioch, they fasted when they sent Paul and Barnabas on a mission trip. And then, of course, Paul and those on his team fasted when they appointed elders in all of the churches. So, I mean, you've got a long list of different people that have fasted in the Bible for different reasons, enough to make you go, hmm. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, I want to try to give you as much uh, st stuff I can from not only the Bible, but examples, but also some practical tips here, because let's be honest, we rarely ever talk about this. And then when we acknowledge that it's in the Bible, we go, okay, so what? And we really don't know what to do with it. So that's my goal in this message is to give you a, a handle on this issue so that when you walk out, you go, okay, I'm better familiar with what the Bible teaches about this. For instance, there are different kinds of fast. I didn't know that. Uh, my story real quick, I was a college student at Union University a long time ago. And I had been reading and praying and studying, and all of a sudden I came across this idea of fasting in the Bible. And it was one of those things where you say, Marty, what well, sounded like a good idea at the time, right? And I decided just to cold turkey fast to see how long I could last. And I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a plan. Just wake up one day, I'm going to fast. I fasted for three days, and I got sick as a dog. And I haven't fasted much since then, can you tell? <laughs> and so, so I want you to be more informed than I was. There are different kinds of fast. One is a normal fast. Now, what's a normal fast? A normal fast is when you abstain from all food, but not water. Okay, but not water. That is the most common fast. It's believed that's what Jesus did when he was in the wilderness for 40 days. Uh, at the beginning of his ministry. In Luke 4, 1, uh, Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And when they were over, he was hungry. All it says is he didn't eat anything. It doesn't say whether or not he drank water or not. We don't know, but it implies that he had a normal fast where you abstain from all food, but not water. And then there is a partial fast. What's a partial fast? A partial fast is where you limit uh, what you eat. Um, for instance, remember Daniel in the book of Daniel when um, they were selected to be these special men that the, the king was grooming and they had to do all the protocols and they had to follow the king's diet. And Daniel approached the guy and said, can we just uh, do a proposition? Can I... Can uh, me and my friends, can we just eat vegetables and drink water for 10 days and you compare us to everyone else? And he, he agreed to do it, and of course, God gave him favor. That was an example of a partial fast, okay? Uh, he was excluding certain types of food and limiting what he ate. And then, of course, there's the absolute fast. The absolute fast, that's where it's no food and no liquid, not even water. You get the idea there. Uh, now, there was an absolute fast in the Bible. Uh, Esther, if you remember uh, Queen Esther, she decides that she's going to approach the king on behalf of her people uh, so that they won't be exterminated. And she tells Mordecai to go tell everybody, tell all the Jews who can be found in Susa to fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. And after that, I will go to the king, even if it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So that was an absolute fast. Of course, uh, Saul, when he became saved and became Paul the Apostle in Acts 9.9, 9, he was unable to see for three days and he did not eat or drink. Little obscure facts in the Bible that we miss if we're not paying attention. Uh, there are more kinds of fasts. There is a supernatural fast, which is what um, Elijah and Moses did. If you remember their stories, they, uh, they fasted for 40 days. And uh, like Jesus, except uh, in Deuteronomy 9, 9, um, Moses says, When I went up the mountain 
to receive the stone tablets, the tablets of the covenant the Lord made with you. I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I did not eat food or drink water. An absolute fast for 40 days. Um, no wonder Moses was lonely. Nobody wanted to hang around him, right? No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, there's other kinds of fast. There's the private fast. The private fast is where you decide to fast as a personal decision. Uh, but this is what Jesus taught us about it. Don't let people know you're doing it. Remember in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, he said, when you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have the reward. But when you fast, put hole in your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others, but to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then there's another kind of fast. Did you know there's a congregational fast? Now some of you are going to go, don't even think about it, right? There are. There's a congregational fast. In Joel chapter 2, aren't you glad that's Old Testament? But in Joel chapter 2, uh, it says, Blow the horn uh, in Zion, announce a sacred fast, proclaim an assembly, gather the people, sanctify the con congregation, assemble the aged, gather the infants, even babies nursing at the breast, let the groom leave his bedroom, and the bride her honeymoon chamber. In other words, calling everybody, come together, we're having an assembly, and we're going to have a fast. And that's what happened in Joel chapter 2, a congregational fast. I know there's a, a fellow a minister friend of mine in Tennessee that once a year their congregation actually does a fast. Uh, they're not Baptists, by the way, but that's beside the point, right? Uh, so anyway, there's another congregational fast in the New Testament in Acts 13. The church at Antioch, was. Uh, there were prophets and teachers in the church, and they were all worshiping, and they were fasting. And there in verse 2, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And so there's another example of a congregational fast. And then there's uh, one more fast, and then we'll move on, and that is a national fast. And you know what? We actually have those in our history. If you go back and you read the history of the United States, you go back to Lincoln and further back than that, there are instances in our nation's history where our presidents called for a national fast. And it's in the Bible, too. In the Second Chronicles 20, um, um, there were some enemies that were gathering against Jehoshaphat, King Jehoshaphat. And the people came to King Jehoshaphat to tell him that they were being attacked by an enemy. And there in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 3, Jehoshaphat was afraid, and he resolved to seek the Lord, and then he proclaimed a fast for all Judah who gathered to seek the Lord. They even came from all the cities of Judah to seek him. And so he proclaimed a national fast for all of Judah, and they all came together to fast, not just to say, I'm not going to eat, but to take the time they would spend eating and really focus on seeking the Lord. And they did. So, you know, you may not think about it, but when you think about it like this and look at the scriptures, it's a theme that runs throughout the Bible. Now, what does the Bible teach about fasting? I'll make this short and sweet. We're expected to fast. Let's go to Matthew 6 in the New Testament, the Sermon on the Mount. Remember, Jesus is preaching and... Um, I want you to see what he did here. He, uh, let's look at uh, Matthew 6, verse 2. In Matthew 6, verse 2, whenever you give, and then he gives you instruction on how to give. And then in verse 5, whenever you pray, and then he gives instructions on how you should pray. And then in verse 16, whenever you fast, and then he gives instructions on that. Now, we look at that and go, well, I don't have any problem praying. It's biblical, right? Okay. I don't have any problem giving. It's biblical, right? What about fasting? It's biblical. It, Jesus dealt with these three topics all the same. He didn't say if you pray, if you, um, if you give, or if you fast. He said when you pray, when you give, when you fast. In other words, the assumption was he expected you to fast at some point. And whenever you decide to fast, there's things you should know so you know what to do and what not to do. There in um, 
Um, that's, that's what Jesus taught. We're expected to fast. Also, consider the example of the early church. Again, going back to Acts 9, verse 9, uh, Saul, who became Paul, the, the Apostle Paul, his salvation story. Remember, he got blinded on the road to Damascus. He was unable to see for three days, and he did not eat or drink that entire time that he was blind. I mean, God really got his attention. Not only did God take away his sight, but Paul used that time to fast and say, God, what are you doing? He had God's, or, or God had Paul's undivided attention, you might say. In Acts 13, as we mentioned earlier, the church in Antioch, they were worshiping the Lord and fasting when the Holy Spirit said, I want you to send these two out to go on a mission trip. And then, of course, Acts 14, 23, uh, it says uh, Paul and his mission team, when they had appointed elders for them in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And so you see this uh, example of the early church. Now, some of you that really like to read your Bibles, you're probably sitting there going, but isn't there a story about Jesus' disciples not fasting? Are you sure, Brother Corey, uh, that, that we, should, should, should we really fast? Because remember the disciples of John the Baptist who one time came and asked Jesus point blank, why don't your disciples fast? And that story's tucked away in Matthew chapter 9, verse 14. Those of you who haven't been listening are suddenly going, all right, the good part, I like that, right? And so in Matthew 9, 14, it says that John's disciples, meaning John the Baptist, uh, they came to Jesus saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And here's what Jesus said. He said, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Uh-oh. He's talking about us, isn't he? See, Jesus is saying, look, you know, you don't fast when you're at the, the wedding ceremony and everybody's celebrating this, this beautiful, you know, moment together. It's when, it's when uh, the groom is taken away, that's when you fast. Well, Christ came. And he walked among us, and he had an earthly ministry, and he ultimately died on that cross. And then he rose from the grave, and he appeared to many people over 40 days, and then he ascended to heaven. And now we fast until he comes. And so, yes, even what Jesus said applies to us right now. Donald Whitney said it this way, Jesus said the time would come when his disciples will fast. That time is now. Until Jesus returns, he expects us to fast. Now, Bill Bright, and I want to share some stuff with you from Bill Bright. Uh, if you're not familiar with Bill Bright, you should be. Campus Crusades for Christ. He's the one that founded that organization. Of course, they're not known by that anymore. Today, they're simply known as CRU. C-R-U. Don't ask me what it stands for. Uh, trying to keep up with stuff. Uh, just like Baptist Student Union when I went to college, it's now BCM, Baptist Collegiate Ministries. It just keeps changing, doesn't it? Uh, one thing we do as Baptists is we just change acronyms all the time. But uh, Bill Bright said this. He said, for believers, the question is not should I fast, but will I fast? Now, let me say this real quick. I'm not laying down a law or anything like that. I'm just simply letting us see what the Scripture says about this. Jesus didn't command us to fast. And everybody went, amen, right? But uh, he did say, when you fast, here's what you should do. And he didn't even tell us how often to fast. He just simply gave us instructions so that when we fast, we know what to do. The negative, the negative command is don't be gloomy like the hypocrites. They want to be noticed by others. You know, the hypocrites, they would maybe not shave and they would not clean themselves and if they walked around and somebody said something well I'm fasting in other words leave me alone and that kind of let everybody know oh okay so they're they're fasting and, and they did it for show that's why Jesus called them hypocrites and Jesus is saying when you fast don't do it for show. Don't do it to announce, oh, I'm fasting. Don't do it to try to send a signal that you're super spiritual or anything like that. You're not doing it to be noticed. You're not doing it 
for show. And its positive command is fix your hair, wash your face, don't make it obvious to others that you're fasting. In other words, if you're fasting, you're doing it for one reason. You're doing it to focus on the Lord. So don't worry about what other people think or say or do. You focus on Him. It's all about seeking Him, focusing on Him, drawing closer to Him. And here's the promise that Jesus gives. He says, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. Because some of you might go, well, if nobody knows I'm doing it, when what difference is it going to make? It's going to make a lot because God knows it. And if he knows it, then he will reward you. And that's a principle of Scripture. So why should you fast? I'm going to make this real quick here. Why should you fast? I was looking at a whole bunch of reasons, and there, uh, there's probably some stuff you can find online where I think people have used the same source over and over, and it's hard to de- determine who that source was. So I just looked at that, and I tried to boil it down to three things that I'm going to give you very quickly. Uh, I would say that you fast for three reasons. Number one, devotion. Okay, devotion. In other words, uh, maybe you're at a, at a point in your life Maybe you're not where you feel like you need to be spiritually and you want to, you want to do something to um, be more diligent and devoted to the Lord. Uh, in the Old Testament, many times people fasted uh, when they were repenting, just like uh, the city of Nineveh in the book of Jonah, for example. They, they uh, fasted as a sign of repentance. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, maybe you really want to do what this series, sermon series, is aiming to do, and that is to tune out the, the noise that's always out there around us, that's always so good at distracting us, and just kind of unplug from that for a little bit and really connect and seek God and focus on Him. Fasting is a way to do that. Um, again, I would say let the Lord prompt you if you decide to do that. Uh, And if the Lord doesn't prompt you, then don't worry about it. We're not commanded to do it, but we are given instructions when we do it. Devotion is one reason why we would fast. The second reason why we would fast is direction. Um, If you've got to make a major decision in your life, and you've read the Bible, and you've prayed, and you've talked to godly, wise believers, and you're still going, "I I just don't know, I just don't know then perhaps you should try fasting. Uh, When you look at the scriptures that we've mentioned already, Paul on his missions trips, when he appointed elders in every church uh, that he would leave behind, uh, he prayed about that leadership position. In the Old Testament, Esther, uh, Esther, when she decided to go before the king to risk her life on behalf of her people, she fasted for three days and three nights. And so anytime you've got to make a major decision, Uh, You know, look at Paul when he was converted to Christ. Look at Jesus when he began his earthly ministry. They fasted. And so when you're seeking direction from God and you've tried everything else, fasting could be an option. And the third reason why I think people fast is deliverance. Deliverance. Um, In the Old Testament, Jehoshaphat. He called for a national fast because an enemy was coming against Judah to attack them. And he, he was afraid and he felt threatened. So he called for a nationwide fast. And then God delivered. Uh, in the New Testament, remember the story when um, Jesus was on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John. And he was transfigured among them. And down, down at the bottom of the mountain, the disciples that were left behind were trying to cast out a demon. And they couldn't. And when Jesus came back, he cast out the demon. And then they came to him and they said, hey, why couldn't we do that? And he says, this is a case that required much prayer and fasting. Okay, that's in the story. And so when it comes to deliverance of some form or fashion, you might need to fast. Because those three reasons, devotion, direction, and deliverance, seem to summarize, if you will, All of the reasons why people, either in the Bible or just in church history and even today, may choose to fast. So, I want to take about five minutes and I'll be done. I want to give you some very quick tips, okay, very practical tips that I found from an article that I had 
uh, from Bill Bright. Now, Bill Bright, again, as I said, founded Campus Crusades for Christ. It's known as Crew Today. Bill Bright, uh, he actually went on record and said he had fasted 40 days more than once in his life. And so I, I like somebody that's lived in my lifetime, that's tried this, that I can learn from and say, okay, what did you do? You know, what, what did you do that I can take away from this and learn? And I'm going to give you seven things, and I'm just going to run through these very fast. Number one, set an objective. Okay, set an objective. In other words, why are you going to fast? Do you feel led to fast? One of these three reasons I told you about, the uh, devotion, the deliverance, the uh, direction. Uh, is there something going in your life that you feel like I've done all these other things and I still just need some clarity, I just need some uh, conviction from what God's trying to say uh, to me that you've decided to fast? You just need to know why. What's the objective for fasting? Number two, lay a spiritual foundation. Lay a spiritual foundation. Uh, and again, fasting has other benefits. It has health benefits. Um, it has um, certain you know, dietary benefits, but that's not why we're doing it. Make sure you know the why and lay a spiritual foundation. You need to have a, a clear plan on, I'm going to take this time, ever how long or short it's going to be, and I'm going to do all I can to seek the Lord and have that spiritual foundation set at the very beginning. Number three, make physical preparations. Uh, plan ahead of time and make physical preparations. If I'm going to do this, what am I going to have to do? What are some choices I'm going to make? What are some decisions I'm going to have to make? Uh, what are some things I'm going to have to change uh, that will affect me and probably the people around me, like family and so forth? Uh, make those physical plans and preparations. Number four, ask God for guidance. You need to pray about your fast. Uh, don't just do what I did when I was in my early 20s and wake up one day and say, I'm going to do this. And I had absolutely no clue. Ask God for guidance. Number five is limit activity. Understand that if you're going to go on a fast, it may not be a good idea to run a marathon three days later. Okay. In other words, just limit your activity, plan ahead, look at your schedule, make a provision for this decision you're about to make. Number six, consider your medications. That's a big one. If you uh, take medications, you definitely need to talk to your doctor before you try something like this, okay? Let me say that one more time. If you decide to fast and you take medicine, make sure you talk to your doctor before you ever do it. Don't say that preacher said, so I just woke up and did it. Nope. You consider your meds, talk to a doctor and make sure you get that cleared. And then number seven, plan your prayer time. Plan your prayer time. Don't just, uh, you know, don't just wing it. Uh, plan your prayer time. I'm going to pray during this time of the day. I'm going to meditate on this portion of scripture. Have a plan so that as you go through the process, uh, you don't add to the, the confusion and stuff. And then, of course, the last thing that uh, Bill Bright says is to think about how you break your fast. Uh, that was another mistake I made when I was in my early 20s. When I decided to say, I'm done, I just went to the buffet. Bad idea, okay? Bad idea. And so how to break your fast? You've got to be intentional, you've got to be careful, and you've got to be gradual in returning to eating uh, what you were eating, especially if it's, if, if it's a fast of more than a couple of days. Uh, Bill Bright says the idea is to ease back into regular eating with several small snacks during the first few days. This requires discipline, but you will avoid the severe pain and other serious physical reactions that come from eating too much too soon. Now, with all that said, I want to close with one last passage of Scripture, and that is Isaiah the prophet chapter 58. I want you to realize that just because fasting is in the Bible, and even though we're not commanded to do it, if you choose to do it, it's not some magic charm. It's not some way where you can say, well, I'm going to fast, and I'm going to get God's attention, and I'm going to get him to do what I want. He's not a genie in a bottle. It, it does not work that way. 
Matter of fact, the uh, Israelites got to a point to where they thought like that because in Isaiah 58, Verse 1, it says, cry out loudly, don't hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Uh, so God is telling the prophet Isaiah, tell my people to repent of their sins. He says, they seek me day after day and they delight to know my ways like a nation that does what is right and does not abandon the justice of their God. They ask me for righteous judgments, they delight in the nearness of God. Well, so far it sounds good, don't it? In verse 3, he says, Why have we fasted, but you have not seen? We have denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed. Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast and oppress all your workers. So verse 3 summarizes a conversation that God's people would have with him in the Old Testament. It's as if the, the people of Israel are saying, God, why have we fasted and you haven't done anything? You don't, you don't seem to care. You don't seem to notice. I mean, we've pushed the plate back for how many meals now? And why aren't you answering our prayer? Why aren't you honoring our fast? And the Lord says, look. He says, you do as you please on the day of your fast, and you oppress all your workers. See, he's flipping the script on them. You have fasted in the past, Israel, because the enemy was coming to attack. And you fasted and you prayed, and I honored what you did. I noted your humility. I honored your, your seeking me and trusting me and obeying me, and I took care of the enemy. Now you're thinking, we'll do this again, and God's going to bless us. And he's saying, you need to look in the mirror. You now are oppressing your workers. You have areas in your life that you need to deal with before I can bless you. And so there in verse 4, he says, You fast with contention and strife to strike viciously with your fast uh, fist. You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast I choose be like this? A for a person to deny himself, to bow his head like a, like a reed, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes. See, it had become a thing of show. He says, Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast I choose to break the chains of wickedness, to untie the ropes of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and the homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see them, and not to ignore your own flesh and blood? Here's what he's saying. Isaiah the prophet is saying, fasting is not a good luck charm that you can just incorporate when you need it to force God to do something because it's impressive. Like, who wants to go through the trouble of fasting? Remember the publican? Remember Jesus said that there were two people that went to the... Uh, synagogue one time and only one went away justified remember the publican he walked in and he's like uh, or the pharisee i mean the pharisee walked in he saw the publican over there and he says god you know i tithe i fast twice a week and i do this 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 and i'm glad i'm not like him and then the publican he was so broken and humble he smote his chest and he said god have mercy on me a sinner and jesus said which of those men went home justified or to put it in our terms which of those men got saved well it was the guy that said lord have mercy on me a sinner i want to close with this uh, thought today before you ever fast you need to make sure that you know the lord if you want to get god's attention the best way to do it is to call out his name and say lord save me lord have mercy on me a sinner you know, to me, that is the, the best uh, sinner's prayer I've ever found in the Bible, Brother Marty, is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Because in that one sentence prayer, he knows who's God. He knows who he is. He's a sinner. And he knows what his greatest need is. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so I want to encourage you today, if you've never made that decision to trust and follow Jesus, if you've never been saved and you're thinking, how can I get God's a favor in my life? How can I get God's attention? Does he even care? Does he even notice the things that I do? Well, he knows all about you and he loves you. But the first prayer you need to pray is, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. When you realize who he is, he's God and you're not. When you realize that you're a sinner that's going to stand before him someday, you're going to be judged by the law, and you're going to be found guilty. You have an opportunity right now while you have breath to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And that's where it starts. That's where it starts. Uh, that is the heart of a fast. It's saying no to everything else and yes to Jesus. And that fast allows you to enjoy the feast that we'll have with him someday. Because he is the bread of life. He is the living water. He satisfies and you'll never be hungry. You'll never be thirsty again. So let's all stand. We're going to have a time of invitation. Maybe God is speaking to you right now. And I just simply pray that you will do what, what God is leading you to do. Maybe you need to say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You've never asked Jesus to come into your life. You've never uh, sought him for salvation. That is priority number one. And then as far as this message today, if you don't feel led to fast, don't worry about it. It's not a command, okay? But if you ever feel the need to do it, now you know to go to the Bible and be informed on what to do and what not to do. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time together to worship you, to study your word. Father, I pray for each person here right now, Lord, if there's someone that doesn't know you, if there's someone, Lord, that's never took that first step of faith, turning from the world, trusting fully in you, Lord Jesus, I pray right now they'll simply say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Lord, they'll call out to you and ask you to come into their life and change them and save them. And Father, I pray that they'll come and share that with us. We'll pray for them. We'll encourage them. And then they too can be baptized, just like Roman was, letting people know that they are part of the family of God. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We ask for your will and way to be done in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. God bless you. Good to see everybody here today. You got a nice full house, so good to see everyone here. I want to ask a Roman mom and dad. Is he here? Is he in Children's Church? Did he? Okay. Well, why don't you go ahead and get him? I'll wait for him. Yeah. And, and ha have parents and grandparents come. You want to come on, Marty? And um, I'll tell you all a story while he's going to get him. Um, kind of like you were sharing some traditions a while ago, Brother Marty. Uh, previous church that I served one time went and visited a senior adult lady in our church and she had just gotten baptized like a year before I came and I guess it must have been an interim you know that 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 did it and they did the baptism at the end of the service and then when she was done she went and got cleaned up and dried off and everything and you know everything had to look just so and she come out nobody was there <laughs> nobody was there you know, and this is one of those public moments. It's a family thing where we welcome them into the family of God. It's a time of encouragement. We want to let them know that, that we care. And uh, like you said, we want this memory to stick, right? So that they always remember the moment when that happened and uh, the confession they made before the body of Christ and just the encouragement to to receive from that body as well. And so that's, that's kind of my thing right there. Don't want to let anybody miss their moment to celebrate what God's done in their life. And so uh, there you go. Um, they'll be here in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs>
sometimes when you get talked out, brother, you get talked out, right? <laughs> Land the plane. All right, there we go. Come on down with mom and dad and grandpa. And, and uh, I want y'all to just stand right here. And uh, Rowan, this is a time when someone gets baptized, we want to celebrate. And so all these people want to come and just smile and, and, and shake your hand and just uh, let you know they're proud of you and they care for you and they celebrate what you did today. Uh, confessing Christ before the body. All right. Well, I tell you what, since Brother Don was involved once upon a time, Brother Don, would you close this?